kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, who has safely brought us to the beginning of this day, defend us in the same with thy mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings, being ordered by thy governance, may be righteous in thy sight, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, we beseech thee, grant thy people grace to withstand the temptations of the world, the flesh, and the devil, and with pure hearts and minds to follow thee, the only God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all evermore. Amen. Okay, so we'll go ahead and uh, <clears throat> read our passage from Matthew. We'll say a few things about it. This is actually right where we left off uh, last week. So Matthew 22, beginning at the beginning of that chapter. Matthew 22, beginning verse 1 says, uh, Again, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast but they would not come. Again he sent other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. The king was angry, and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? He was speechless. And the king said to the attendants, Find him hand and foot, and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. So, we talked about sequels last week, right? Uh, reboots, stories that echo other stories. Uh, that was our opening analogy. We talked about the movie Enola Holmes uh, and the Sherlock Holmes stories, and we mentioned some other things, Star Wars. Um, what did we say? Anybody remember what we said about sequels and reboots? Other than knocking Star Wars. We already mentioned Star Wars this morning. Uh, prequels are better than sequels. <laughs> We notice that in Matthew uh, 21, in the story in Matthew chapter 21, which is another parable, the parable of the wicked tenants, uh, they were supposed to be looking after the vineyard, and that story sort of echoed uh, an Old Testament story from Isaiah chapter 5. Uh, well, not to get too meta, but in a way, uh, this week will very much echo last week. This morning will echo... Uh, last week, because the parable that Jesus tells in Matthew 22, which is right where we left off, uh, very much echoes his last parable in Matthew 21. So we can think about what this story is doing on its own terms, what it's about, and then also how it relates to chapter 21. If you weren't here last week, don't worry too much. Uh, you should still be able to follow along. So what were our two rules of thumb about parables last week? May you remember? I said, an Old Testament story. All right, the one is that uh, Jesus' parables usually lean on or retell some Old Testament story uh, or borrow some Old Testament imagery. So how did we see that play out last week in Matthew 21, the parable of the 
Yeah, it's a story, as we said, of a, a vineyard that's supposed to be fruitful. It retells a little story from Isaiah chapter 5, which was a picture of God's people, Israel, as a vineyard, that he intended to be fruitful, to bear fruit, to be just, to be righteous. Uh, and they had not been, so he says he'll judge them. And what did we see that was new in Jesus' story? It goes beyond Isaiah. I'm still thinking about last week. The son shows up instead of just more servants. <clears throat> There's more characters, right? Even the servants are new uh, in Jesus' version of the story. And we interpreted the servants with John's help as, as uh, those who come in the master's stead. And that story as the prophet's. Uh, and of course, centrally, yes, the character of the Son is new to Jesus' story in Matthew 21. Jesus himself puts himself in the story. He comes speaking for the Master, and in the story, he's beaten and killed. And that brings us to our second rule of thumb about the parables, which is what? So the parables echo, usually echo some Old Testament story, and. Turn it on its head. Yes the twist, but they're usually about what? Your Sunday school answer. Jesus. Yeah, they usually <laughs> are uh, about Jesus. They give us some window in on who he is and what he's up to. They're ways of explaining his own work. So what did we learn about Jesus in Matthew 21 last week? We've already said a couple of things. What did we see from the parable of the He come, well, we notice first, yeah, that he comes in the line of the prophets. He's like a prophet. He comes as a prophet, but more than a prophet. And uh, we learn about his death. And where do we see ourselves in that story? If you glance back at chapter 21, where do we see that we come in? We Gentiles. We are the secondary people. Yeah, these are the other people, the other people that the vineyard is opened up to so that uh, the master can have his vineyard bear fruit. People from the other side of the world, thousands of years later, people from nowhere that the vineyard is open to. That's, that's us, because the master will have his vineyard be fruitful. So we're called now ourselves to bear the fruits of, as we read in Isaiah 5, justice and righteousness. All right. So try to hold that in your head. That's 21. That's last week. Uh, I want to do a similar exercise with this passage this morning, a little briefer, hopefully, to what we did last week. So taking our rules of thumb one at a time. It's another parable. Uh, and parables normally echo some Old Testament passage. So again, happily this week, the lectionary gives us just such a passage, again from Isaiah. So flip over to Isaiah chapter 25. Somebody feel like reading a few verses? Isaiah 25. Is it starting at verse 1? Yeah, Isaiah 25, 1 through 9. Okay. O oh Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name. For you have done wonderful things. Plans formed of old. They for sure. For you have made the city a heap. Fortified city of Rome. The foreigner's palace is a city no more. It will never be rebuilt. Therefore, strong peoples will glorify you. Cities of ruthless nations will fear you. For you have been a stronghold to the poor, a stronghold to the needy in his distress, a shelter from the storm and a shade from the heat. For the breath of the ruthless is like a storm against a wall, like heat in a dry place. You subdue the noise of the foreigners as heat by the shade of a cloud. So the song of the ruthless is put down. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all people a feast of rich food, a feast of well aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. What do we see? What would you say this passage is about? The destruction of nations. Okay. 
Where do you see that? There's city walls that should not be rebuilt. Yeah. There's some destruction, some judgment. <laughs> what else? What else is going on here? There is some judgment and destruction. Maybe God's provision for his people. The appointed psalm today is Psalm 23, so think about that in connection with this passage. What do we see? What's the picture of God here? Kind but wrathful. Okay, yeah. So to elaborate on both of those a little, it's God, the God who's worthy of his people's praise. That's how the passage starts. Sheltering them, sustaining them in his kindness. Uh, what's going on in verse 7? Swallowing up the covering that is cast on the people and uh, the veil that is spread over the nations. God removing the separation between his people and the nations. Interesting. Keep that in mind as we move back into Matthew. Verse 8 is probably familiar to you if you remember from our Revelation series that last year. This line is quoted in Revelation, probably better known from the Revelation quotation, but it's quoted from this passage. God's care and kindness, care for and kindness to his people. So what's familiar having read Matthew 22? What does Jesus borrow or echo from this passage in Isaiah? The destruction of people. That's part of it. Yeah. Big destruction focus going on. This uh, as soon what as else? I heard the city, there's a more obvious one, but that's, that's part of it. Yeah. God's name to know Good song stuff. Like that. Yeah. What's the big one? What's the, the central kind of image here that Jesus borrows in his story that he tells? Yeah. Yeah, the feast. It's a wedding feast, right? It's this big, rich food and wine. Um, Isaiah 25 is about God giving his people this rich feast. And that's the heart of the story that Jesus tells in Matthew 22. Um, the wedding feast. What's new in Jesus' story? What does Jesus add to this story in addition to the feast stuff? Ooh, wedding. It's a wedding, yeah, right? That's a good catch. Actually, not a wedding in Isaiah 25, right? It's just a feast. So there's a wedding on behalf of whom? Whose wedding? In Jesus and... Jesus is later uh, in the New Testament compared to, well, maybe actually in the Gospels. Good little catch for somebody to throw at me as the bridegroom in the church as the bride of Christ. Oh, but the son is the one whose wedding it is in Matthew 22. So more characters again, right? So he has a king, and there's the king's son, and there's servants. So it's very like the parable of the tenants in Matthew 21. Uh, and some of the servants are seized and killed again. What else happens? <clears throat> the king comes in judgment and destruction, as John was so keen to point out. And the servants are told to go out and just find people off the streets to invite to the feast, to bring in. Both the bad and the good, it says in verse 10. I'm back in Matthew 22 now. Till the wedding hall is filled with guests. Our second rule of thumb, what do we learn about Jesus? He don't discriminate between the sinners and the saints. All right. Why do you say that? Because it said find good and bad. Yeah, very interesting in verse 10. The servants are told to go and invite to the wedding both the good and bad, just everybody. We might say in the same way that... Uh, in Matthew 21, part of the point is that even though the people that the master left in charge didn't do what they were supposed to do, the master still intends that his vineyard will be fruitful. It will be fruitful. So he gives it to others so that it will be. Uh, likewise here, even though the people who were invited to the wedding feast don't want to come, the king, the father of the son, is still going to have it, the feast. Uh, the kingdom that Jesus is bringing into the world is happening. Even though he's rejected, even though he'll be killed, God's work will not be stopped. His vineyard will be fruitful. He will give a wedding feast. His kingdom will come. He will accomplish his work of saving his people from sin and death so that they can be fruitful, so that they can grow into the people he's made them to be. And he 
will sustain them and give them cause to celebrate. So you see how this passage is, is like chapter 21. Um, it makes the same points as that parable. Jesus is saying again that he is God's son. Come to his people to bring in God's kingdom, which will be brought in. All right, so what's going on? I'm trying to wrap up here in verses 11 and following. What guy with the wedding garment, the wedding clothes. What do you think the wedding garment is? What does it mean? stuff that you wear away. Okay, that'd be at the literal level. What might be symbolized here? You're our symbol man last week. You gave us the servants as the prophets. The son is Jesus. What's the wedding garment? Jesus' righteousness. Okay, why do you say that? Yeah, we talk that way about his righteousness, right? Something you put on. Paul talks about that, putting on righteousness, arming ourselves with uh, grace and the virtues, all these other things. Yeah, he might be thinking of this story. Paul's writing before the Gospels were written, but he probably knows some of these stories, pieces of teaching from Jesus. I think um, that, yes, what I'm about to say is kind of a way of saying that. I think... Um, Part of the point of this story is that love, unconditional love, perfect love, divine love, changes us. It transforms us. It doesn't leave us as we are. So in the story, presumably everyone else here in this scene, uh, except this one man, does have wedding clothes on. And these are people just off the street, though presumably their wedding clothes were given to them by the king. But the problem with this man is he hasn't changed. He hasn't changed. And that's the point. Does that make sense? Uh, God does find us where we are, wherever we are. And he calls us to join the kingdom and he welcomes us in. Remember verse 10 again, both bad and good. But that's not all that happens. We're meant to change. So when we think about the church and the world, the church and culture, uh, the church and our city, um, our own lives and the lives of uh, people in our lives who aren't Christians, uh, I think we risk making two mistakes. And one mistake is to give people the idea that if you want to come around and be part of what we're up to, if you want to be a Christian, uh, if you want to be a St. Andrews, then man, you really need to get your act together because God is in the business of good church people. You may not be yet good enough to come to God. But we learn from this story that that's not the way that God works. He says in verse 9, Go out to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you can find, both bad and good, so that the wedding hall is filled with Guests. God calls to every man, woman, and child, no matter how good or how bad. He seeks them out, and he invites them to be part of his kingdom. He welcomes them. And we need to be clear, as Christians, as a church, as individuals, that the people in our lives who are still outside the church know that they are welcome. Not only by us, but by God. God invites them to a great feast. But another mistake we sometimes make is to only tell half of the story. To so emphasize that God welcomes everyone just as they are, maybe we were worried about the church being perceived as judgmental or condemning. We don't want people to think that. So we say, no, look, everybody uh, is, is welcome to come and be a part of God's church, and you just be who you are. Um, God's not going to shake up your life or change things for you. Everything's fine just the way it is. Well, that's not true either. We know in our bones that that's not true. We all know that there are things about us that we should say yes to and, and celebrate and cultivate. But we also know that there are things about us that we have to say no to and turn away from. 
and repent of. Uh, we know that if we follow our own hearts, our own minds, our own changing desires, they're not going to lead us where we want to go. We need to change. We need to be dressed, so to speak, in the wedding clothes. God finds us where we are, and he welcomes everyone where they are, but he doesn't leave us where we are. We ought to think through this not just with respect to uh, our, our, our own uh, Christian or non-Christian friends and, and, and our city, but, but when it comes to our own lives, our lives as Christians, as part of a church, as part of a community at St. Andrews, are we changing? Are we growing up in Christ? Is our worship shaping us? Are we learning uh, not just about God, but how to love Him? Are we putting our sins to death? Are we being made more like Christ? These are the things that we're called to do together. And last point, we asked toward the end of our time last week, where do we see ourselves in this passage, Matthew 21? Uh, who are we? We notice that we're the people randomly at a left field that the vineyard gets opened up to. The, the people from outside. So, so where are we in this story in Matthew 22? Technically. Right, because exactly. We're thinking literally. I mean, the kingdom exactly of God right. was originally for the uh, for the Jews and so on, so that came out in the Middle East. And, you know, I'm going to assume most of us are from Northern That's right. Europe. That's exactly right. So we are the people from the street in this story. We're the random people that God has sought out and invited in to his kingdom. So, may we come in. Be part of his kingdom. Be made fruitful, made to grow, celebrate, be fed, sustained, and may we be changed. Uh, I'd ask if you have any questions, but we're over time, so I'm going to say a prayer for us. Let you go and see if I can compel some acolytes. You asked me. Just a regular morning prayer this morning, I think. Okay, let's pray. <clears throat> o God, who makest us glad with the weekly remembrance of the glorious resurrection of thy Son, our Lord, vouchsafe us this day such blessing through our worship of thee that the days to come may be spent in thy service through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord.